Hi everybody, this is Jeremiah, and today we're going to talk about Minimax extensions. The first approach we're going to talk about is what we call alpha-beta pruning. Alpha-beta pruning is a branch and bound extension to Minimax. And what that means is that we branch out and then we place limitations, we place bounds on the tree as it grows. We prune the branches that we consider unnecessary. And in this case, we're going to be able to determine mathematically that some branches cannot yield a better result than we can already achieve by other means. So first things first. In most ways, alpha beta pruning acts just like regular Minimax. Given this particular arrangement with the checkerboard that we've looked at before, Max first has a decision to make. Our first option is that Max can move A up and to the right. If Max does so, that will leave Min with a few options. In the first case, min moves D down to the right. That will result in an evaluation of zero, that is, a tie. On the other hand, min could move D down to the left. That will result in an evaluation of one. Between zero and one, min is going to select the branch that yields zero. So up to this point, the results have been the same as minimax. At this point, we know that max can achieve a score of zero, even in the worst case. So this will become our lower bound. We will not accept anything that will give us an evaluation at or below zero moving forward. Taking a step back, max could move A up and to the left. In this case, min has a few more choices. The first one we are going to look at is moving C down and to the right. Moving C down to the right will give us an evaluation of zero. One key difference between regular Minimax and Minimax with alpha beta pruning is that every time we have an evaluation, we're going to compare it against our threshold. In this case, our value is equal to the threshold. If we consider this situation, min will not accept a value higher than zero. So in effect, this branch becomes less than or equal to zero because there may be a higher value among the remaining choices, but min, which remember is a simulation of our opponent, not the actual opponent, our simulation will always choose the lower value. As a result, this number could get more negative, but it could not get more positive, hence the designation less than or equal to zero. Now let's take a step back and look at this from Max's perspective. He has one branch that is a guaranteed zero, and another branch that is less than or equal to zero. In other words, this new branch does not really serve us in any way. Even in the best case scenario, it cannot yield us a better evaluation than the previous branch, than our threshold. As a result, it does not make sense to expend computation time and memory to explore this space. So we will prune the remaining possibilities and we will throw out this branch. Continuing on, another option is for Max to move B up and to the right. And you probably already see a pattern happening. If we move B up and to the right, then Min has four possible options. If Min chooses to move C down and to the right, that will again result in an evaluation of zero, which makes this branch less than or equal to zero, which means that it is not worth spending time to explore this branch either. Finally, Max could move B up and to the left. This yields two possibilities for Min, the first of which is moving C down and to the right, which yields an evaluation of 1. In this case, our branch is less than or equal to 1, which means it could still be better than 0. So we continue. The other option is to move C down and to the left. This results in an evaluation of 0. And between 1 and 0, Min is going to select the 0, so now this branch is less than or equal to 0. At this point, we know that this branch also cannot yield a better result. If there were other options, we would prune them. In any case, we still invalidate the branch. Max will select the first branch because this is the only one that was completed. And if we look at this from an overall perspective, we'll see that about half of the state space was explored compared to the regular Minimax algorithm. So this is a significant improvement. If we take a look at the algorithm for alpha beta pruning, it's very similar to the regular Minimax algorithm. In fact, we can build from the Minimax code just adding a few values to track our alpha and beta, our high and low threshold values. We do need to add some code to set the high and low threshold values for min and max levels respectively in order to make this work. An important point is that the alpha and beta values technically start out as positive and negative infinity so that any comparison yields a new threshold value. Expect a minimax is a variant of minimax that accounts for random events. Many interesting games involve random events. Monopoly, backgammon, and various card games are a few good examples. When we have this type of game, we're going to introduce a construct known as a chance node 
that we'll find an expect a min and expect a max value. Let's consider the case of Monopoly. And let's say that the player is currently in jail. The player has to make a decision. Should I pay to get out of jail or should I not? But in order to make that decision, we have to consider what the possible results might be of getting out of jail. There are times, especially toward the end of the game in Monopoly, where it does not make sense to get out of jail because you're likely to just end up losing the game if you do. So let's take a look at how we might make this evaluation. If we're in jail and we're considering paying to get out of jail, let's look at what might happen if we roll the dice. In this case, we're going to have a die roll, and then the player is going to get to make a decision, and then we'll have an evaluation as a result. We're going to use a simplified version of Monopoly in which we roll only a single six-sided die. So the probabilities will all be one in six. Usually we would roll two dice and the probabilities would vary, but this makes for a more reasonable and condensed example. If our player rolls a one, that player will end up on St. Charles Place. Let's assume for the moment that this property has not been purchased. The player has two choices. The player can buy the property, or the player can choose not to buy the property. Let's assume, for the sake of argument, that our player starts out with $160. And any property is worth about its face value plus $30. So if the face value of a property is $120, it's actually worth $150, and so on. St. Charles Place is priced at $120. As a result, our player has enough money to buy it. If our player chooses to buy St. Charles Place, he will end up with $150 worth of property and $40 in cash for a total of $190. If he chooses not to buy the property, he will have $160 in cash. Between these two options, based on our evaluation, it makes sense for the player to buy the property. If the player rolls a 2, the player lands on the electric company space. For this example, let's assume someone owns the electric company, and as a result, they have to pay the owner $20. If the player rolls a 3 and lands on States Avenue, a result similar to rolling a 1 occurs. That is, the player has a choice to buy the property or not to buy the property. Buying the property results in an overall value of $190, while choosing not to buy the property results in a value of $160. Expect a max, being a good player, is going to choose $190. Likewise, rolling a 4 results in the player landing on Virginia Avenue, yielding the same results as States Avenue and St. Charles Place. If the player rolls a 5, the player lands on the railroad. However, the railroads cost $200, so the player does not have enough money to buy the property. Our last example, 6, uses community chest, even though that's not actually the 6th space. But let's assume for the moment that it is. Further, let's assume that we've done an evaluation of all the community chest cards. And on average, they yield a benefit to the player of around $80. So our evaluation is that if we land on community chest, on average, we'll gain $80 worth of funds. We've now evaluated all of the possible outcomes of different die rolls. What we do next is multiply the resulting value by the probability and add them all together. This will give us a weighted average of all the possibilities. In this case, that weighted average is 185, so we would assume that if we got out of jail, the evaluation of the game state would increase by about $25. Expect a minimax is one of the ways that we can deal with random events, but it doesn't come without its own set of issues. One of the issues is that the tree grows even faster than regular minimax, because we're also introducing a branch for every single possible random event. Many games are also psychological in nature, for example, poker and they introduce random events to introduce emotional stake into a game. As a result, these emotional cues are not necessarily going to be picked up by the algorithm. Finally, because all the values in Expect a Minimax are the results of application of probabilities, there's no way to know if they will actually be accurate. In addition, the more applications we have of probability, the muddier our results get because we end up taking an average of average of averages. For this reason, expect a minimax is usually only used when we're going just a few ply deep.